Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Now this serpent was more shrewd than any wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Is it really true that God said that you must not eat from any tree of the orchard? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the fruit of any of the trees in the orchard, but concerning the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the orchard, God said, You must not eat from it, and you must not touch it, or else you will die. The serpent said to the woman, Surely you will not die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree produced fruit that was good for food, it was attractive to the eye, and it was desirable for making one wise. She took some of its fruit, and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Thank you, Beth. Uh, That is our text for today. We're in the middle of a series we started last week. Uh, It's called The Snake in the Garden, where we're looking at the reality of spiritual warfare in our lives. And what we want you to know on the very front end is that we ultimately have an enemy. If you're seeking to follow after Jesus Christ, whether you are or you aren't, you have an enemy who's at work in this world who is committed uh, to stealing, to killing, and to destroying. What he wants to bring about in your life is pain and suffering and destruction. And sometimes we go through our lives unaware that we do have an enemy. And so we don't know that we should fight. We don't know how to fight. And as a result, we ultimately get devoured. And so last week we wanted to be really clear uh, that though we find sin in the world, that the world can uh, exert a sinful influence on us, the world is not our enemy. Uh, we, we talked that even though our, we have fleshly desires and inclinations towards sin, our flesh is not the enemy, right? We have an enemy that is Satan. He is the one who's at work in this world. He is the one that we do battle against. So our battle is not flesh and blood. We said really clearly, if there is a person in this world, there's a a party, a group, and a, like a, a, any collective of people that you have believed is your enemy, um, you're in error, right? You've been deceived. And you, if you're fighting against flesh and blood, you're fighting the wrong battle. As a matter of fact, our, our battle is not flesh and blood, but it's powers and principalities of darkness, spiritual forces in the heavenly places. What, what, what he's saying there is that we're ultimately, we're in the midst of a spiritual battle that's raging all around us. And so it's not something that we're going to fight with our hands and our, our feet. It's not something we fight physically, but rather this is a spiritual battle. And Paul says, hey, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And here's the hope for us. In Jesus Christ, we already have the victory, right? Jesus rose from the grave on the third day, victorious over sin and death, over every ruler and power, authority and dominion. But for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we've got to walk in that. We've got to put on the armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, and we walk in the things that we have been given in Christ Jesus. Now, this week what I want to do is I want to start to talk to you about the tactics of our enemy. How is it that Satan would be at work in you and in me, in your family, in the people that you know, in this church even, to lead us astray from the narrow path that Jesus Christ has invited us to walk, the path that leads to life, um, the things that the enemy would do to lead us astray from that path and ultimately lead us to that broad path that most people walk, And that is the path that leads to destruction. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to see the tactics of the enemy and ultimately how we should respond. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, if, if you were to look back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we see that God has created the heavens and the earth and the plants and the trees and everything in the world, the creeping things that crawl along the ground. God has created it all, and in Genesis 1, 31, he tells us that God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything in all of God's creation was good. Now, this leaves Eve at a bit of a a disadvantage. Now, it's not a disadvantage at all. She would submit to the Lord. But Eve had never uh, faced deceit before. 
She'd never faced anything but good. As a matter of fact, God had placed Adam and Eve in the garden. He's like, man, enjoy all of this. It all belongs to you. You have dominion. You have authority over the animals, over the plants. As a matter of fact, God had told them, you can eat from any tree in the garden. God had given them every good thing. They didn't lack anything. As a matter of fact, God had given them himself, who was perfectly good. He walked with them and talked with them in the garden. God had not withheld anything from Adam or Eve. And yet, the serpent shows up. The enemy shows up in the form of a serpent. And it begins to speak to Eve. The, the scripture here tells us that he is crafty. What you need to know in your life is that when the enemy shows up to begin to deceive you, he's not going to show up like with a bus and flashing lights and sirens like, hey, you know, hop on board to the path of destruction. That's not how the enemy comes. As a matter of fact, the enemy often manifests himself in something that would, in the beginning, look to be friendly. Even never encountered sin. She never had to deal with deceit. And so the serpent comes, and the reason she didn't run away is he didn't show up saying, hey, God's not real. He didn't say, I'm God. He didn't say, you know what, you should bow down and follow me, Eve. Matter of fact, he began deceiving Eve with just a really simple, innocuous question. Hey, Eve, did God really say that you're not supposed to eat from any tree in the garden? He just began to ask her a question, subtly questioning the word of God. Now, again, this is Satan in the form of a serpent. He looked friendly. Now, I, I don't get this, right? I don't look at snakes and think, oh, yeah, friendly. We're going to hang out. Like, we should spend time together. But again, everything God had made was very good. And so Satan was disguised here. Again, he didn't show up flashing lights like, hey, don't follow God anymore. Go your own way. Like, you know, let's go to destruction together. He was crafty. And he showed up in a very subtle way. Now, Jesus has told us that this will happen in our lives as well. As a matter of fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, the inaugural sermon of Jesus, he warned us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. He said, beware of the false prophets. And you might say, okay, who are the false prophets? And Jesus would say, well, I'm glad you asked. He says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. And for those of us, a couple thousand years uh, after the time of Jesus Christ, when he spoke these words, we're living in America, we live in Oklahoma, most of us, like we're living today and we're like, I I'm not sure I've ever seen a false prophet. I'm not sure what that would look like. Well, I'll tell you what a false prophet looks like. It looks like a sheep. It looks like someone who's genuinely interested in the things of God, right? Isn't that how the serpent came? Hey, Eve, um, did, did God really say, let's talk about what God had to say. Let's talk about the Word. Let's talk about God's principles. Let's talk about the things of God together, Eve, right? And so it would set her at ease immediately. In our culture, false prophets, the deceiver, he's not going to come looking like a wolf. He's going to come looking like a sheep. And I would want you to be aware, like hear the words of Jesus and know that there are likely already among you in your circle wolves who are disguised as sheep. And it may even be so subtle that they would want to talk to you about the things of God. Hey, let's talk about what God had to say. Can we talk about what life and spirituality and those sorts of things might mean? Jesus told us that we can recognize false prophets, the deceiver. We're going to recognize them by their fruit. And so we should be able to look at their life and see what's being born there. Not over a short season. You can fake it for a while, right? Uh, if you've gone to church for very long, you know that on a Sunday morning, you can show up and put on a smile and say, like, bless you, brother, and shake hands and do all sorts of things that make it look like on the outside, life is good. But you can't fake fruit for long, can you? In our lives as believers in Jesus Christ who want to walk the path that leads to life, who want to live the abundant life, who want to enjoy all of the good things that God has given to us, believing that the things of God are ultimately for our best. They are the best things that we could possibly ever choose. We've got to be wary that we're not misled by false prophets, that we're not misled by the wolves who might come in sheep's clothing. And so we've got to inspect the fruit of their lives, and we should be cautious about them. 
uh, when, when the Bible talks about uh, elders, uh, the people that ought to be pastors and leaders in the church, the people that you should ultimately submit yourselves to, follow after them, like uh, sit under their teaching, uh, it, it speaks of elders, and they ought to have a good reputation, not for a few days, uh, but for a few years, you ought to see a good reputation. You ought to see men who are hospitable. Like there's a lengthy list of qualifications that aren't black and white, like check yes or no kinds of things. But you ought to see fruit being manifested in their lives. I mean, just warn you, we live in the day uh, where the Internet brings a lot of people who are far away very close. We have blogs and we have Facebook. We have YouTube. We have podcasts of anyone, anywhere. Let me just caution you. You can't examine fruit if you're not up close. I've told this story here before of when I was a kid, I would go to my grandmother's house, and I'd walk in the door, and in her living room was this ornate glass dish, and there, was the, there were these grapes on the dish. And from afar, they looked really good, but when I went to sample them, they were actually made of plastic and completely unsatisfying. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, you can fake fruit from afar. From a distance, false fruit looks like real fruit. And so I would just want to warn you as the people of God seeking after Jesus Christ who want to walk in his truth, be careful. If you can't see the fruit of their lives, you should be wary. That doesn't mean there aren't great teachers out there. That doesn't mean you can't listen to sermons and podcasts and the various things. I would just say be very careful, uh, especially when people are at a distance from you because wolves come in sheep's clothing. The enemy will disguise himself in order to deceive you. The text continues here. The enemy continues working in the heart of Eve, who'd been given every good thing. But he wants to lead her astray. He wants to lead her to destruction. And so in verse, the end of verse 3 here, he says to the woman, Indeed has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman says to the serpent, She actually knew her stuff. Which is very helpful, by the way. Um, if we're ignorant of what the Word of God has to say, if we haven't read the Scriptures, like we don't know what the Bible has to say, we don't know Jesus Christ, we've never learned to follow after the Holy Spirit, we're already in dire trouble. If you want to know why our country is in the condition that it's in, it's not because of that group that you want to point a finger out and say it's their fault. They're the ones leading astray. If you want to know why our country is in the condition it's in, it's because the people of God are in ignorant of the word of God. And oftentimes it's been the church that will go along with false teachings because we're too busy. Because we're scrolling through social media and sports pages instead of looking to the word of God. We're ignorant of what the scriptures actually say. So here the enemy comes to Eve and he says, hey, Eve, did God really tell you? And he actually distorts what God said. Look what he says. Did God really say you shouldn't eat from any tree of the garden? And that's not at all what God has said. He says, you can have it all. Every good thing is yours. Just don't eat from this tree. It's the one tree that would make you conscious of the bad. It's the one tree that would make you have understanding of the evil and the pain and the brokenness of this world. You've already got the good. It's already there for you. Stay away from the one that's going to be, bring death and pain and destruction into your life. Did God really say? Did God really mean what he said? Hey, don't eat any tree in the garden. Right? And Eve responds in kind. She knew. Verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we can eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, she may have added a little bit here, maybe touching the tree. She added that language in. It's not what's recorded there in chapter 2 of Genesis. But she was on point in terms of her understanding. Like, don't eat from this tree. It's going to bring death into your life. But the enemy is already sowing the seeds of doubt, of distortion. He wants to ultimately deceive Eve. You shall not eat from any tree in the garden. The correct answer was no. That's not what God said. She had it right. God had been good to them. He'd given them freedom. Any tree that you want, just not that one. Have all of the good. I just don't want you to have the bad. I just don't want you to have the things that are going to bring destruction into your life. This happens constantly in our culture. Constantly. 
matter of fact, when I read blogs and I hear the news and, you know, you hear people that are um, up in opposition to God and, and the Word, and, and, and all, oftentimes this happens even with so-called Christian bloggers that really do think they're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're like, hey, did God's Word really mean what it meant? Did God really mean what He said whenever He said this? Um, to you moms who are in, in the room today, and we want to honor you today. I'm going to avoid picking on you, but I want you to know that even for you ladies, God meant what he said in his word. For you husbands who are out there, when God called on you to love your wife as Christ has loved the church, he meant what he said. And if you remember the work of Jesus Christ for us like uh, Paul, in, in explaining the marriage thing, he puts it in the context of the gospel. He's like, you want to know how marriage is supposed to work? It's supposed to work like Jesus in his church. And if we remember what Jesus did for us, he found us uh, in our sin. The only thing that you and I brought to the table was sin and shame and guilt. And yet Jesus saw us in that, and he chose to love us in spite of our sin, in spite of our inadequacy, in spite of our brokenness and rebellion. And really, we, we just didn't have a lot of things to bring, but he loved us anyway. And Jesus loved us enough to suffer and to bleed and to die for us. Men, God really called you to love your wives that way. For better and for worse. Through the good and the bad and the ugly. And the enemy's going to come in and he's going to say, Hey, God really tell you to love your wife even when she doesn't um, give that back in return? Even when she's not everything you thought she ought to be? When she doesn't serve you in the ways you think she should serve you? When she doesn't care for you in the ways that you think she should care for you? Man, when there's a season of sickness and you just having to take care of her, did God really say that you should love her in that way? And the answer is yes. God really meant what he said when he called us to love our wives in this way. And wives, God really meant what he said when he called you to submit to your husbands in that way, in everything. And that is the beauty of the gospel. Students, I want you to know that God meant what he said when he called on you to honor your mother and your father. Even when they're old and out of touch, right? Even when they're kind of embarrassing and they don't seem to get everything that's going on with the world, when they don't understand, God has called you to honor your mother and your father. Church, God has called us to love our neighbor even when they fall on the opposite side of the political aisle. Even when they believe things that you believe are kind of destructive or they aren't going to advance the causes that you think need to be advanced, do, are we supposed to love them? The answer is yes, not just your neighbor, but even your enemy. This is what it is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. The enemy, did God really say, does he really expect you to love him? To love her? You know what he's done to your family? You know how difficult she makes your life at work? Did God really say that you're supposed to love that one? And the answer is emphatically yes. God's word means what it has always meant, and you can trust the word of God to lead you to that which is good, that which is the best in your life, and to keep you from the things that are ultimately going to be for your destruction. God's word still means what it meant. This is true for your marriage. It's true for your personal integrity. It's true for your business. It's true for your sexuality. It's true in every way that if you want to know the highest form of good, if you want to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ and live a life that glorifies him, you'll believe that what God said is true and that you can trust him to lead you to life in the midst of obedience to that. And so the enemy, he comes in and he's disguised. He doesn't look like some terrible person who's out to destroy he shows up as one of the good things of God's creation. Talks about the things of God, but he's ultimately there to deceive Eve and to lead her astray. He continues on here. From the, hey, did God really say, um, he's going to respond again with another very subtle step down the path to destruction. Look in verse 4. The servant said to the woman, because Eve has replied correctly, God said don't eat of it or we're surely going to die. In verse 4, the serpent says to the woman, surely you won't die. Hey, surely this little compromise won't be that big of a deal. Surely what other people don't know and they don't see it can't possibly hurt them. You know what, if your wife doesn't know, your husband doesn't know, oh, it surely won't cause pain. 
Your parents don't see it. Nobody has to find out. Surely you won't die. Hey, it's just a little bit of gossip. Everybody does it. It's just a few too many drinks. No big deal, right? Surely we won't die. Just a few comments online. A few angry words toward my children. Surely we won't die. The enemy deceiving us into diminishing the danger of sin, the destructiveness of sin in our lives. May I remind you, I'm going to cheat ahead in the story a bit, Eve, Adam, with a single bite of a single piece of fruit in the Garden of Eden thousands and thousands of years ago, with that single bite of that single piece of fruit, they brought untold, incalculable sin, pain, destruction, suffering, and death. Now, how arrogant would we have to be to believe that our sin wouldn't have the same effect? How foolish would we have to be to think, oh yeah, her sin mattered, but mine didn't. And we look around us, we know what it feels like to be sinned against. We've experienced the bitter pain of the poor choices of others. How foolish would we have to be to believe that our sin didn't matter? It's really interesting here in, in verses 5 and 6. Sin goes from, and, and Eve was really clear about it, uh, surely we can't eat of it like we don't eat of this tree or surely we're going to, to die. Sin goes from deadly in the mind of Eve to desirable in just a span of a couple of verses, a couple of exchanges with the enemy. Look what she does here in verse 5. The servant says to the woman, you surely won't die because God knows that in the day uh, that you eat from it, your eyes are going to be open and you'll be like God and you'll know good from evil. Eve, you won't need God anymore. And no more that you're like this subservient thing where you're dependent upon God and he's the great and glorious God and you've got to come to him. Eve, you can have it all for yourself. And you can be like God. You'll know good from evil. What he's promising her here, what he's laying out here is, hey, God's been holding back from you, Eve. He hasn't given you all the good things. There's something else good for you. But the truth of it was, she already knew the good. The enemy was just handing her evil. Verse 6, Eve has bought the lie. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it's kind of a silly statement, isn't, isn't it? Because you can't see that. You can't look with your eyes and know something's good for food. If you've ever been to Mexico and had a dessert, you know that you cannot look at a piece of dessert and know that it's good with your eyes, right? I, I went when I was younger. My parents took me all-inclusive. I was pumped up. I'd eaten a buffet, but I had some room, you know? And so I go by this dessert table, and it's beautiful. Like, they decorate that stuff, and it looks just like, like you know the little fudge brownies you get? Like, it was sort of a dessert, kind of like that, like the little Debbies. And, man, I was so excited. I choose this one that looks rich and amazing, and then I took a bite of it. And it's basically like those lies that those dadgum diet people tell you, like, hey, this is going to be just as good. It just has no sugar. It was awful, right? It was miserable. I was like, I was so disappointed in this dessert that looked so good, but it was actually devoid of anything good, which is the sugar, right? It was, it was empty. So Eve somehow has seen that this is good for the eyes. This is the, the Hebrew word ra'ah. It means to see or to perceive. I would argue that Eve had begun to believe the lie. That the thing that God had told her was going to destroy her was actually going to be for her good. She saw, it says she saw, that it was good for food. It's not poison, and this is a privilege. And this isn't destruction, this is a delight. This isn't going to bring devastation into your life. This is something you should desire. And she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes. The tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Did you see the steps that we took there? This thing's gonna, this thing's gonna kill me. God said, like, don't eat of it, or surely we're gonna die. And she took a really subtle step. With, well, maybe I won't die. Maybe this is good for food. Maybe it won't kill me. Maybe it's not poison. Maybe it's not destructive. Maybe I'll just have a bite. And the next thing you know is she looks at the fruit. She takes a step from, hey, it won't die, to maybe it won't kill me, to suddenly, hey, that looks pretty good. Matter of fact, 
it's, it's, it's a delight to my eyes. Like that, that, that looks like it might be something I enjoy. And then the final step here is it was desirable to make one wise. That which was really there to destroy her. The thing that God said, don't eat or you're going to die, um, is something that she ultimately believed was going to enrich her. It's going to make you wise. Now we see this. Like Eve, good grief, you got deceived, this fan of just a couple of exchanges with the enemy. How could you fall into this once again? And yet, if you're a person of God who's ever made an attempt to follow after Jesus Christ, you know that this happens over and over and over and over in our lives. The moment that Adam and Eve took the bite of the fruit, verse 7 says their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They covered themselves. We're going to talk about that more next week. But they recognized the folly of their sin. And many of you, you've played this cycle out in your life. Where you sin, you fall, and you feel, you taste the bitter fruit of sin. And you swear to yourself, I'm never going to do that again. And the next day, the next week, the next month, you fall right back into the same thing. Believing the same lies again. The enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Today I want to ask you the question, um, where are you believing the lie? Where are you beginning to take the bait of Satan? Or maybe he's promising you some pleasure in your life. Maybe he's promising power. Maybe he's promising some form of enrichment. And he's beginning to ask you the question, did God really say or maybe it's the question, or it's beginning to call into question, hey, surely you won't die. Surely sin won't have that sort of consequence in my life. Surely I'm unique, right? Where are you buying those lies in your life? In what areas are you starting to see sin as a delight? Something desirable? Something that might enrich you? Jesus told us, that there is a foolish way to live for the people of God to hear the word of God. Maybe even agree with it, right? Ah, oh, yes, Jesus, he's truth and he's life. And so we hear the word of God and we don't put it to practice in our lives. He said the person that does that, Matthew chapter 7, is one who's like the guy who built his house on the sand. We hear the word of God, but we don't do the word of God. And when the storms of life come, when the winds blow, the rains fall, that house falls with a great crash. But the wise man is the one who hears the word of God and puts it into practice. The storms come, the rains fall, the winds blow, and that house stands firm in the midst of the storm. Last week we saw the Apostle Paul calling on believers in the midst of spiritual warfare to stand firm. And we do so in Christ Jesus. Our enemy is bent on destruction, but Jesus wants to lead us to life. So my question for you today is, is it divorce? Is that the lie that you're believing? Did God really say, I'm supposed to love my spouse in this way? Does God really hate divorce? Maybe he's come in and said, hey, um, surely you won't die. And it won't be that consequential. I'll move on to another spouse, greener pastures, smoother waters. I'll just go do that and life will be better. And it, even in those thoughts, you see that the enemy has led you from what God said was going to bring destruction to believing somehow it's going to bring life. Sometimes it's with our words. We're like my kids, right? They, they sing the little song, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And somehow we believe that our careless words toward our spouse or our friends or our children hey, it's not that big of a deal. I just got a little angry. Everyone loses it sometimes. Did God really say that our words matter? That there shouldn't be foolish talk among us? Does God really say that the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of Christ? Did God really say, and so we utter words of gossip, of anger, I just need to vent, and pretend like destruction isn't waiting. For that person and for us. Maybe for you it's the way that you handle your time and your talents, your treasure, your, 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 your energy. And chasing after all the things of this world. As if God doesn't really care. As if it really doesn't matter the things that you pursue. The decisions that you make. 
the priorities that you set. Satan's distracting you. He's disconnecting you from the body. Somehow you believe that your kid needs to play sports more than you need to be connected to the people of God. And when we believe the lie of the enemy, that the things that are there to destroy us are ultimately going to be for our good, the enemy's job's easy, right? And we just run headlong. We think those things are for our good. I want to challenge you to think about your life. To think about the voices that you're listening to. Are they speaking the word of God back to you? Are they calling you to faithfulness to the word? Are they calling you to the good things of God? To enjoy all of the good things that God has given to us? Or are they pointing you toward the few things that the enemy would wish for your destruction? You see, there's good news for us. The enemy would wish to lead us astray off of the narrow path that leads to life, to the broad path that leads to destruction. The enemy would want to bring about deception in our lives where we won't walk in the truth. Like ultimately, he wants to lead us to death. He wants to lead us to destruction. But Jesus Christ, he came to earth like God. He took on flesh and he walked and he said, I am the way. In this narrow path, it's the way. I am the truth. Instead of being deceived, you can walk in truth. You can walk in me. That I am the life. Rather than living a life of destruction, you can live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus. We've all been led astray. We've all fallen into sin. Every single one of us. If you've listened to this today and you haven't thought, oh, I bought that one. Man, I've walked in that lie. I, I remember this pattern. If you haven't seen it, you don't know that. Listen, you're not paying attention. Every person in this room has walked the path of destruction. We've walked in deceit from the enemy. But there's a better way. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, those of us who've fallen and we've entered into sin, we've experienced the brokenness and the pain and the destruction. There's, there's hope. The Apostle Paul tells us that it was for freedom that Christ set us free. For many of us, we find ourselves in bondage to sin, and we've been hurt by people, and we're just living that out in our lives, destruction happening all around us. But Jesus Christ, he went to the cross on your behalf to bear the weight of your sin, your guilt, and your shame. He rose on the third day, and he sent his Holy Spirit to live within us, that we don't have to live under the power and enslaved of sin any longer, but we can walk in freedom, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, where God said, hey, all of this is for your good. Man, I've given you all these things to enjoy, and it is very good. The things that I've given you, those are good. Run after them. Enjoy them. But stay away from these things that are ultimately going to be for your destruction. Jesus Christ, it was for freedom that he set us free. And so he reminds us, don't let yourselves be enslaved again to sin. If you're here today, you never trusted in Jesus Christ. And as I talked about the choices, about the deception, about the consequences of sin. You're very familiar with the consequences of sin, but you've never known the forgiveness that's available to you in Christ Jesus. Maybe maybe you've given up hope that your life can ever be better. I want you to know that Jesus Christ said it for you. The enemy did come to steal, kill, and destroy, and you've seen that true, but Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Like today is a day where you can begin to walk a new path, following after Jesus Christ in submission to his word, walking in abundance. Let me, let me just say this. There is hope for your marriage. There is hope for your kids. There is hope for your life. There is hope for you in the midst of your brokenness and your circumstances because of the person and work of Jesus Christ who saw you in all of your sin and gave his life that you might find a new life in him, that you could walk this path of abundance. And so today, we're going to have a time of response. And if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to trust him today. That you would look at his word and say, Jesus, I'm going to believe you. And you begin to walk in obedience to him. That if Jesus fills your heart with faith, today is a day of salvation for you. If you're here and you're a believer, you followed after Jesus, but you've been deceived. You're buying the lies of the enemy. And today is the day to armor up. To look at the word of truth. Put on the belt of truth, right? Remind yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus, of the goodness of God toward you, and begin to repent of those sins. Would you bow with me? Father, we're so thankful that you are the way, that you are the truth, and you are the life.
that we don't wander around in darkness in this world trying to find our own way, but you've given us your son, Jesus, and your word is the, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that we might know the way to walk, that we might know the path to life and abundance. Father, I pray against any power of deception that might be present here. God, help us to see your goodness and your love, that we might walk in obedience to you. God, that we might sow the seeds of good fruit in our life, that we'll get to eat of those instead of the fruit of sin. Lord, I pray for the person who's here today that's never come to faith in you. They've never trusted in you. God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for the husband who's caught up in sin, who's been believing the lie, what they don't know won't hurt them. Hey, surely it won't be that bad. Lots of people struggle. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of repentance for the mom who's been fighting to hold her family together, bringing her kids to church alone, doing everything that she can do to try to serve you with, with little support elsewhere. And the enemy has been beating her up and she's grown weary. I pray that today she might be renewed. And she might see every commandment of yours as an invitation into abundance. God, that she might stand firm even against the forces of deception. Lord Jesus, this is your time. We pray that you would work in our midst, that you would lead us to become fully devoted disciples of yours, not believing anything that's untrue, but instead rooted and grounded upon your word. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.